welcome to Past, Present and Future. I'm Russell Hearn. Today we're stretching out across the Atlantic and we're not stopping there. We're going even further across America to the San Francisco Bay Area to meet international trainer, consultant and author, Dr. Philip Manfield. Dr. Phil, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the studio today. Likewise. And, and amazing this is working. This is fantastic. I, it's so difficult to know where to start with you. There's so much that I'd like to talk about. But if we can, can we go back to that very first encounter that you had with EMDR? When did the penny drop for you that this was an amazing therapy? Well, I, um, I took the training in 91. It was the only training that Shapiro ever did in Berkeley. And um, I, was, uh, I was an extreme skeptic. In the practicum, I chose for my target a car accident I had had a year and a half before. And I had been in Jungian analysis <laughs> for a year and a half trying to deal with this car accident. And uh, here I was working with uh, a therapist who had never done this before. And in 35 minutes, the problem was resolved. And I decided there must be something to this. Wow. And that was the very first training that was held. It was the first one in Berkeley, the only one in Berkeley. And it was one of the first ones in the U.S. So you were saying you sort of sat there and you were feeling around the skeptical. Um, <laughs> and then this, uh, this amazing thing happened. And, and you're thinking, where, where did all my money go on that Jungian analysis? <laughs> Fortunately, it was the other person's uh, auto insurance that was paying for the analysis. <laughs> I, I wasn't worried about that, but it, it, it was pretty shocking, especially here was a therapist who was uncertain of herself and had never done this before, and she's following a protocol, and lo and behold, the disturbance went away. Yeah. Amazing. I know you've written many books, and we're going to talk about a few of those. One of them was uh, EMDR Up Close, The Subtleties of Trauma Processing. Right. Do you think it is a subtle technique? I do. I um, Obviously, the protocol is pretty well standard, but um, to me, it's the difference between are you going to be a therapist who's 65% successful or a therapist who's 100% successful. And um, that's where the subtleties are involved. Well, you can't leave it there. You've got to give us the key, the all important detail. How can you go from 65 to 100? What's that, that really important aspect? As I say, I think it's subtleties. I, I'm sort of ADD myself, and I don't learn well from reading books. And so... As a matter of fact, my friends joke that I've written more books than I've read. <laughs> but uh, so I think uh, I think one has to just watch a lot of sessions. The reason I created EMDRvideo.com is to give people lots and lots and lots of uh, EMDR sessions to watch and to just. I think it's. Um, a lot of what we do as therapists is a kind of complex pattern recognition. And the more successful sessions we observe and the more we participate in, the better we get at this subtle pattern recognition. Often we don't even know what pattern it is that we're recognizing, but then we just say the right thing. I was going to ask you about that because that, that takes a lot um, to set up a whole website just sort of dedicated to you doing your therapy and putting yourself out there for people to watch. Mm -hmm. That's a, an amazing gift that you've given us. I feel wonderful about it. It feels like one of the um, most significant contributions I've made as an EMDR therapist. Can you remember watching somebody else work or a video of them and thinking, oh, that's what I've been missing? Well, I remember when I was first learning to do therapy, my complaint has always been that there's very little that one can watch. But I remember watching a video of Virginia Satir. And I remember um, actually just one turn of phrase where uh, she was talking to, I think, the mother and a family. And then she turned to the child and she said, I bet you know something about that. And it was just a very subtle way of acknowledging that the child had feelings coming up. 
And uh, I just thought to myself, isn't that a beautiful way of communicating? Hmm. Yeah, it's lovely to see people use words in a, in a way that maybe you wouldn't have thought of and yeah, to see the yeah. benefit of those. Mm-hmm. And, and I think you're right. I think it's so powerful to see somebody else working and to do it well. And um, I was remembering watching a, a live demonstration myself that kind of resolved the the suds or the trauma in 10, 15 minutes. And this presentation was going to go on for an hour. Yeah. But the interesting thing and the thing I learned most from that was uh, then installing the, the positive cognition afterwards took the rest of the hour. Uh-huh. <laughs> so it hadn't all been resolved in that 15 minutes. It wasn't a miracle. There was still work to be done. Yeah, yeah. So uh, another of your books is uh, about dyadic resourcing, which is something I'm very interested in. Um, Mm -hmm. Really a foundation for processing, I think we could call that. Mm -hmm. And we have some research now that suggests that preparation is maybe not that important. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm guessing you wouldn't agree. Well, it's not that I disagree with that research. I think the point there is that we can process severe traumas without doing resourcing. The idea of dyadic resourcing, it's a very deep kind of resourcing, and it's really aimed at attachment wounds. So we can take someone with complex PTSD, and and I've done this in the first session sometimes. person has complex PTSD, and they were molested by their uh, father from the time they were five or six years old until they were um, an adolescent. And, um, and we process that first molestation in the first session. And does that mean that the attachment wound is healed? It doesn't. So we can process some very painful trauma um, without entirely healing the person, but Processing the trauma then makes it much easier to then address the attachment wounds. So you get the whole kind of package when you think of it in that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I agree that uh, that resourcing is uh, overrated, it's, but it depends how you do it. With EMDR, we're asking the person to think of their very worst memory and um, the bad rap that EMDR gets is that often people are overactivated, so they're traumatized by the process. And um, it's, it's one of the beauties of the flash technique that we can go into something that would otherwise be terribly overwhelming and we can process it and the person doesn't feel any disturbance in the process. And I'm glad you brought me on to the flash technique, which is, uh, I was going to ask you about that. Where do you think that fits in then with the whole kind of EMDR approach? Well, I think it will help. I mean, the, as I say, the bad rap that EMDR gets is that uh, some clients are uh, traumatized in the process. And I think, I mean, I never do EMDR without flash. And people are never traumatized in the process. So I, I think... Flash has a place in. Well, I agree. It's, it's yeah. certainly that that hurdle that I've got to overcome and, and face this fear as part of this this treatment that uh, that really seems to slow some people down. And yet, the ones who do well are the ones that say, "Well, it wasn't as bad as I thought." Actually, <laughs> um, I noticed that you also appear in the book Three Minute Consultations with the Greatest Psychotherapists, which is quite an honor. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm just, I haven't read it, I must admit, but I'm just imagining how we could have had this conversation in three minutes and that would have just been impossible. But can you sum up in three minutes maybe the power of Flash and its method of working? Well, um, I think uh, there's, a, there's a study that uh, I don't take the credit for finding. One of the people we trained in Flash wrote to us and said, take a look at this study and it's by... Paul Siegel and his associates, and they have uh, published uh, six papers. And it started with a study in which they showed people a picture of a tarantula, people with spider phobia. So half the people saw this spider sitting on the screen and got all activated. And half of them, the spider was shown on the screen so briefly that the people didn't know they'd seen a spider. And... Um, In one of their studies, they did an fMRI to see what was happening in these people's uh, brains. 
And um, the bottom line in the initial study, the people who didn't know they saw a spider had a greater reduction in their spider phobia than the people who knew they saw the spider. So there's a case where the, these people didn't even know they were working on their phobia and the phobia went down. And in one of the studies a year later, the phobia was still down. So it was a stable result. But the fMRI study showed that the people who knew they saw the spider had um, a, an activation of the amygdala and a fight or flight response, essentially. And when that happens, the prefrontal cortex, which is where the processing would normally occur, becomes relatively inactive. But with the people who didn't know they saw a spider, the amygdala didn't get activated and the prefrontal cortex was very active, so they got a much better processing effect. And we think same thing's happening with flash. We are distracting the client so that they are no longer, they don't get into a fight or flight response, uh, the amygdala doesn't get activated, and so the prefrontal cortex gets to be very active and they have a much more rapid processing effect than they would have um, if the amygdala is active. And in the process, since the amygdala is not active, they don't feel disturbance during the processing. Was that three minutes? <laughs> I think we'll allow that. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you. And we were talking to uh, one of our colleagues from the UK the other week, and he was talking about how, you know, the trauma processing EMDR really fitted well with um, uh, military veterans because it, it was a kind of, you know, they were up for that fight against the trauma. Mm -hmm. And that's really what we were asking people to do. Yeah. So the, the um, flash technique really enables someone to face that fear. Yeah, just, I don't even think of it that way because people are just always so surprised that anything happened. You know, <laughs> I tell them, I tell them, look, uh, I have this process and I don't know if it'll help you, but if it doesn't, you'll know in five minutes and the worst you've lost is five minutes. Mm. And then we go and we do it and the person just sort of looks at me uh, my friend Lewis, uh, colleague Lewis, uses the the term gobsmacked look. People so often have this look like, wait a second, <laughs> what happened there? That's a good investment, isn't it? Five minutes and you're on your way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, we also, <laughs> I, I take a long time in history taking and uh, and really getting a strong foundation in working with people The the woman I mentioned who was molested, uh, her therapist brought her and she was sitting in the room. So it wasn't like I was starting cold with her and, and jumping right into her molestation. But I, I spend a long time with uh, history taking case conceptualization. So often there's only 10 minutes left in the session by the time we're done with that. And, and so I, I commonly say to a client, well, we only have 10 minutes left. We don't really have any time to process anything, but we can sort of start on something if you like. And then we do flash on one of their top 10 memories. And, and then lo and behold, uh, it's resolved by the end of that 10 minutes. So it's, it's, it's fun. Yeah, that's a really nice approach too, because I was wondering if, if they're thinking, well, I've only got 10 minutes left. He's not going to do anything that's going to be too much. Right. And I then, wonder if the barriers are down and they're kind of ready for it. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, I mean, uh, promise, uh, promise little and deliver a lot. That's the... <laughs> <laughs> Great line, yes. Um, I, when I did my training, I trained with a, a lady who was a family therapist, and I know you've been a marital family therapist since 1975. And one mm. of the things that she struggled with was the language of EMDR because it didn't fit into her training, her family therapy training. And she always, even though she could do it and do it really well, it just it seemed like a different language. And I wondered how you managed to put your EMDR into your family therapy. Well, you know, I was an analyst when I first was trained in EMDR, and, and I spent a number of years trying to integrate EMDR into analysis, and I finally gave up. But uh, I also have always specialized in couples therapy, and uh, I don't see any conflict at all. Actually, um, 
I start out with a systems approach and out of the systems approach, we basically end up identifying each partner's triggers. And then uh, we use EMDR to resolve the triggers. So it just, it's seamless and um, it, it's a great combination. And we hear a lot about, you know, cases from trainers who uh, are giving us, you know, all the, the best evidence they've got and, you know, the, the amazing stories that they've got about how uh, swift resolution came to clients. But I'm thinking that can't be the same for everyone. Surely there must be still difficult clients. You must still have some difficult clients that make you scratch your head. Surely, please tell me you do. Well, I mean, I have uh, the ones that got away. Uh, <laughs> you know, there, there are a few clients that come to mind and I say to myself, if, uh, if I only had another shot at that client, I think I could uh, finish the job. Uh, it's kind of funny because one client uh, came with a very unusual uh, presentation and and I tried everything I could and I felt bad that I, I didn't really get the resolution. And then later on, uh, when I developed the flash technique, I thought of this guy and I thought, I know I could resolve his problem now with the flash technique. And I emailed him. And I said to him, you know, it's been five, six years, but um, I think if you're willing to come back, I won't charge you. And I think I could resolve your problem. And he wrote back, he said, well, you must be thinking of someone else because you did resolve my problem. I haven't had the problem since. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, that's lovely. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It's been really lovely to hear some of those stories and how your sort of EMDR career uh, developed. I know you're still working on projects now, and I think um, a very timely project to help care workers dealing with the aftermath of COVID-19. Can you give us an idea of what that's about and how it's going? Well, you know, in uh, in developing our, our method of training people to do the flash technique, we innovated this group process where we'll have two or 300 people on Zoom and we'll do a practicum with all of them in which we basically take them through the um, process, the, the flash process. And, um, and then we get their feedback about what's happened to their disturbance levels. And uh, we've done this now with about 6,000 therapists and um, it just occurred to me that we should be able to do the same thing with healthcare workers who are traumatized from COVID-19. So we actually had a nursing union approach us and ask if we could do this. And so we, we jumped at it. We started doing a pilot. We had trouble getting nurses to show up because they're, they're used to helping people and they're not used to being helped. Now we're advertising for nurses, so trying to get nurses in so that we can build up a mm-hmm. track record. And so far, this process has been uh, very helpful uh, every time. And um, so we're looking forward to scaling this and uh, doing it with uh, large groups of nurses. Wow. I'm just wondering how many people you could use that technique with at the same time. Uh, I don't know if there's a limit, really. We um, we always have a couple of therapists on hand in case someone gets overly activated. But so far, that's never happened. I, I don't see a limit, really. Um, Lewis, who I mentioned before, Lewis Engel, made a, an audio that he wanted to put on YouTube so that people could sort of go through the process themselves then we decided that the legal liability was too great to put that out there. So we haven't done it. Um, But I think having some therapists on hand in case someone has a bad experience, Mm -hmm. I mean, it's hard because we say to people, look, we don't want you to start until you have a, a positive focus and no feeling of disturbance from the target that you're working on. So you'd think that nobody is going to get overly activated, but 
you know, once you start scaling up the numbers, you're, you're likely mm. to get somebody who gets overly activated. Is this something we're likely to see in the UK? Oh, yeah. I think it's, I, I mean, <laughs> I had a psychologist uh, who was my interface with the union say to me, you know, you may think I'm getting a little grandiose here, but I, I think this could just spread and could be used with hundreds of thousands of people. And I said to him, there's no way you're going to out grandiose me. <laughs> <laughs> But I, 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 do, I do think that the potential is enormous. So is that the future of EMDR? Sort of big, massive group work, do you think? Well, no, but this, this group work isn't therapy because uh, the idea is that we're having people think of their worst memory with COVID-19 and then we're, we're reducing the disturbance on it. But that doesn't mean they've had therapy. They, hopefully that intervention may prevent a fair percentage of them from getting PTSD. I'm sure you know that uh, a lot of people, they have their disturbing uh, experiences, but they also, those experiences relate to childhood experiences. And then you start opening that up and then you start processing childhood memories. And, you know, uh, that's therapy. This is just an intervention. I just can't imagine actually doing therapy with large groups like this, I, I can imagine motivating people to say, boy, I got a lot from this and I could probably get a whole lot more if I go into therapy. I think it's no mean feat if you can stop some of those people going on to develop PTSD. That, that's it's a laudable idea. Yes, I, I agree. I agree. Fantastic. I'm sure we could continue talking for hours. <laughs> Um, and I, th- I think we've only scratched the surface of your, of your amazing knowledge and experience. It's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. Oh, likewise. Dr. Phil, thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. I've enjoyed it. Past, Present and Future is a Laura Beach production for EMDI UK. 